I had one more announcement, but I didn't give it to him. Why? Because I want to be the bearer of good news. And that is this, is uh, at the end of tonight, after Open Share Group, we're going to have um, free ice cream drumsticks for you guys. So uh, make sure you swing back by the foyer. We're going to give you guys some drumsticks. Um, and make that's not the drumming kind up there, but that's the kind you eat, the ice cream. So just make sure you guys come and get that. That'll be after our Open Share Group time. So look forward to that. So hey, I'm Scott. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ. I'm in recovery from sex addiction and compulsive overeating. Hey, I'm glad you guys are here tonight. And uh, one of the things that I love is I love uncomfortable situations. I've done youth ministry a lot, and I love asking those awkward questions that just make them feel uncomfortable and make them think. Um, I love to tease my kids that way, and now they just say, Dad, Dad, knock it off. Dad, <laughs> Stop it. And, uh, but before, they used to actually um, squirm a little bit and get awkward in counseling. Um, I, I do like those awkward questions because that's how stuff gets out in the open. I love doing that to other people. However, if you ask my wife if I like those awkward conversations, the answer is no. I'm a fearful avoidant, so I like to avoid all those answers and stuff, but I'm working on getting better at that. But the, thing, the reason why I bring that up is because of this, is tonight... Um, we're going to be talking about some uncomfortable places for us. What are some of those uncomfortable places? And in each one of our lives, we've been in uncomfortable situations. And we've squirmed, we've wiggled our way out of it, maybe we've chosen to fight our way out of it, but some way we've done something to get out of those moments. And, uh, and maybe you're the good one in here and you told the truth, but I'm not like that. And so I'm going to assume, since I'm not like that, um, you're not like that. Um, so we're going to go with that. But, um, so tonight, I want to start with talking about some uncomfortable situations. And um, in John chapter 4, that's where we're going to start. And here we have that, uh, a story of Jesus who's on his way to Jerusalem. And as he's on his way to Jerusalem, he could double his time and walk all the way around it. But he chooses to walk through Samaria. And that's where we pick up in John chapter four and verse three through six. And this is what it says. He, meaning Jesus, left Judea and departed again for Galilee. That's where he's going to Galilee. Sorry, not, not Jerusalem. And he's had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar near the field that Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well it was about the sixth hour. And that you go, what's uncomfortable about that? Social norms cried out that this was everything wrong with who Jesus was. He was breaking social norms all over the place. And so the first thing is maybe for you, what are some of those uncomfortable places in your life? What are some of those uncomfortable places for him, it's, it says it right there in John 4, 5. It says this. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. See, Samaria, they were considered as a people half Jews. They were worthless. They were worse than Gentiles. They had no right to worship, worship the Messiah, worship God. They couldn't even go into Jerusalem and worship. They had to have their own place of worship. The Israelites would literally choose to double their travel to walk all the way around Samaria rather than go through it. And Jesus comes to this story and he says, I'm gonna walk through. I'm going into Samaria. I'm gonna go there. And so here's the thing is what are some areas of your life that Jesus wants to get into? What are some of those areas that God says, I'm not gonna let you keep avoiding it, but I'm gonna tap dance right on it. I'm gonna come in to your town, I'm gonna sit at the well, and I'm gonna drink. Are you gonna meet me there? Uncomfortable places. Counseling offices are uncomfortable places for me sometimes. I remember going through counseling with my wife. Those were always uncomfortable places for me. When I was a kid, the dad lectures. I remember Monty's. You remember Monty's on Tully Road? 
I do. That's how long I've lived in this town. Sorry, I'm old. Um, I remember going to Monty's, sitting down, and my dad pulling out a yellow legal pad of paper. Shikook. And on the table, and he would have his list of things that we had to discuss. And I hated it. Every time. To this day, I won't use a legal pad of paper, even though I know it's just a pad of paper. But I have to use something other than a yellow legal pad of paper because that's uncomfortable for me. What are some of those uncomfortable places in your life that Jesus wants to come in and sit with you, that he wants to travel, but you're too busy avoiding it? You'd rather, rather do double work than sit down and let Jesus start to minister to you. Not only uncomfortable places, but uncomfortable times. Uncomfortable times. It says there, it says, it was about the sixth hour. That's the middle of the day. That's the hottest part of the day. I coach football, and um, we have a new coach over the last three years, but the coach before him would have morning practices during the summer, and I loved him for it. I loved getting out there at 7 a.m., 6 a.m., whatever time it was, and having practice before it got too hot. This coach that we have now loves the three in the afternoon practices. It is hot. Do you know the temperature last week? And I was out in the sun, and I have a bald head, and I forgot my hat one day, and it was uncomfortably hot. The time of day was extremely uncomfortable for me. I did not like it. I was sweating. And if you're body structure like me, you get some um, sweat spots that aren't appropriate. And that's what I got. And so bad timing happened. See, that sixth hour, it was noon. It was the hottest part of the day. Nobody else was there. Getting water for your home was the time that you do those things in the morning. Those are the chores you do in the morning. But she chose to go later when nobody else would be there, even though it was the hottest part of the day, even though it was the most uncomfortable for her to do that work, to lug the big jar down there, to fill it up with water, and to carry it back to her home. That's when she chose to do her work. And I know there's a lot of you sitting in here that maybe are having a hard time because recovery is a really bad time for you. I can't believe this came out now. Don't you know we're in COVID? Don't you know what's going on in society and you're calling me to work on my areas of my life? This is really bad timing. Don't you know that recovery is gonna get in the way of my job? Don't you know these things? Timing can be very horrible. Well, you made time for your addiction. You made time for your co-addict. Let's make time for our recovery. Let's take time to work on ourselves, to get up early in the morning to hit a meeting, to get up in the morning to read the word of God, to get up in the morning and pray, to maybe make that uncomfortable conversation with your supervisor saying, hey, I need Tuesday nights off. I need to be off work from Tuesday night so I can get down there to celebrate recovery and so I can go to open share group because I need this for my life. And sometimes we got to do that work, even though it may not be the best timing. Because if you don't deal with it now, you will deal with it later. And later is probably not going to be the best time because it's only going to intensify. Not only is there uncomfortable uh, places and times, but it's also uncomfortable people. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Even she knew, even she knew it was uncomfortable. And she says, how is it you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me? One, a woman, and two, of Samaria. See, Jewish guys didn't talk to Samaritans, and they sure as heck did not talk to Samaritan women. So who, why would you have this conversation with me? See, I think that's part of the reason why I'm a Raider fan. As I know, if Jesus was here, he would be hanging out with all us corrupt Raider fans. And he would love to be with us because that's where the sinners are. That's where we're at, right? And he loves that. And, and I don't know, but that's sometimes uncomfortable. Who are the people that you're uncomfortable talking to? 
Maybe you've spent your whole life outside of church and so the people that you're uncomfortable talking to are church people. Maybe you've been a church person your whole entire life and the people you have a hard time talking to and you feel uncomfortable around are people that are from the street. Maybe the uncomfortable person is that person that's homeless. Maybe that uncomfortable person is the, only, is the same person that literally sleeps in the bed right next to you. Who are the people that are uncomfortable for you to deal with in your life? Maybe it's your own children. I have great children. I've got five of them over there. They're awesome. Silas is 18. Mary is 15. Nehemiah just turned 13 yesterday. We celebrated with some sushi. Yeah. Ezra is 11, turning 12 soon. Boaz is one, turning two in a couple weeks. And so I've got great kids. And they're all great right now. I've been around the rooms of recovery to know that at some point in my life, there's gonna be some great, uncomfortable conversations with these folks. But yet I still love them, and if I care about them, I need to go, I need to have those great conversations with them. Who are those people? Is it that Samaritan person? Who are the people that you keep avoiding? Maybe this is a better question. What keeps you avoiding those people? Is it guilt? Guilt of your behavior? Maybe it's shame. Maybe it's the shame of your circumstances. The fact that you're so embarrassed, how could this happen to me? Everybody's gonna think that I'm a weak woman because my husband's out with all these other women. And you're embarrassed. I'm gonna be taken a fool again. What is it that keeps you from talking to other people? Maybe it's that un uncomfortable sin. I mean, she says, she says this in verse 17 and 18, I have no husband, because he says, go, get your husband, come back. And she says, I have no husband. And she just said, we're, you are right in saying that. I have no husband. For you have had five husbands. And the one you now have is not your own husband. Now that is five husbands. That's a lot of husbands. I love my grandma, but my grandma had five husbands. That was a lot of husbands. I never knew what to call my grandpas. I had no clue. There was a lot of family going on there. And here's the thing, is that's a lot of stuff happening. Some would say maybe she's loose, something like that. There may be something going on. But there was definitely a sexual brokenness that was there. Maybe your sin is different. Maybe your sin that you're not willing to deal with is drugs. Maybe it's alcohol. Maybe it's compulsive overeating. Maybe it's that person that's still in your home and you're that co-addict and you're struggling with anger and control and you don't know how to deal with it. You don't know what to do. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's your sexual orientation. Maybe you're confused. Maybe you don't know. But what is that maybe uncomfortable sin that you're not willing to deal with yet? I just found this out, by the way, a couple weeks ago. Blew my mind. Reading this book, and in this book, it asks this question. So what is worse, the act of sexually acting out or the lying about that sexually acting out? And I'm like, for sure, it's the sexually acting out. And I'm laughing in my chair, and I'm like, babe, 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 let's answer this question. I read the question, and she's all, oh, the line. And I was like, what? It blew my mind. I'm like, are you kidding me? And she's like, oh, yeah, by far it's the line. I'm a liar. <laughs> At my core, as far as I remember from being Boaz's age, I've been a liar because I'm a fearful avoidant. I don't want to get caught in those sticky situations, so I'm going to lie and manipulate to get out of them. That blew my mind. And so guess what I've been asking to deal with lately? My lying. The small lies. The big lies. All those lying. In AA, they call it rigorous honesty. Oh, that is hard to live. No, I'm like, okay, honest about like everything? Yes, everything. Every aspect of my life 
Because if I lie about leaving the toothpaste cap off, what that translates is if they can't believe me about that, my wife can't believe me about that, how is she going to believe me about not looking at porn? Oh. <laughs> well, there, in my mind, there's a big difference, but in her mind, boop, same thing. Unbelievable, mind-blowing, changing for me, crazy stuff. Not only that, but then we have this one last uncomfortable situation, and that is this, the uncomfortable request. Jesus, after dealing with this woman, knows all these things, dealing with these things, he says this, he says, give me a drink. Give me a drink. See, this is the, this is the savior. This is the Messiah. This is the one that had been prophesied about. This is the one that they've been waiting for that at any time is fully God and can get water anytime he wants. He says, give me a drink. And she says, wait a minute. She's like, um, <laughs> why do you want water from me? That's crazy. And you may be asking that because you may go, God, do you realize what I have to offer? I mean, have you seen my life? I mean, do you know what I do? I know I haven't done my fourth step yet, but I imagine there's a lot of stuff on there because I know the secrets I keep. Or maybe you've done your fourth step and you're going, God, have you seen my fourth step? <laughs> and you want water from me? And yes, give me some water. Give me that water to satisfy my thirst. And he, and, and he goes on to explain that he's got living water he goes on to explain and says, if you knew who I was, you'd ask me for water, ask me for a drink, and I would give you living water. That would quench your thirst and you'll never thirst again. God comes and he sits with us at this well and he asks that question, give me a drink. The question for you is, are you willing to give over the stuff in your life to God? The uncomfortable places, the uncomfortable times, the uncomfortable people, the uncomfortable sin, are you willing to hand those over to God and let God take those from you so that he can give you that living water that will help quench your thirst? Because in all my uncomfortableness, in all my inadequacies and all the things I was going to porn to get comfort for or going to get comfort from food, that never satisfied me. What satisfies me is when I go to God, when I go to Jesus and he gives me that living water and he satisfies my soul. But see, the story doesn't really stop here because it really Actually, it doesn't stop. It doesn't even start here. If we go back to that beginning where it said this, it said, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph, Jacob's well was there. We need to go and we need to realize what was this well? Where did this story kind of begin? Well, he starts to turn it to good, these horrible things in our life, he turns it to good. And here's where we have it in Genesis 50, verse 20, where Joseph is talking to his brothers, 11 of his brothers and his dad, who basically sold him into slavery, and now he's second in the kingdom, and he comes and he says this, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive so that they are as they are today. You meant it for evil, but God took it and he turned it to good. God took these things and he turned it to good. Who was Jacob? Well, Jacob, he was born clutching the heel of his brother, which tells us the struggle. There was a struggle in the womb, it says in scripture. Born holding that heel of his brother, and he fought with him for the inheritance until he finally stole it. He stole his brother's birthright, not only the physical, but the blessing from his dad. 
He was a liar, a manipulator. He had an anger problem and berated his father-in-law. It says that berated, ESV version, love it. Berated him. <clears throat> he even wrestled with God. See, wrestling is a biblical sport. <laughs> Put your kids in it. But here's the thing. He wrestled with God. And God changes his name from Jacob to Israel. And Israel means strives with God. And God took those things and he turned it for good. Joseph, who was Joseph? Well, he was a spoiled brat in the family. He was the guy that was the favorite son and flaunted it with his brothers. <clears throat> he was arrogant. Look at me, I got this coat. Dad give you a coat? Nope. I got this coat of many colors. Check it out. Rocks it in the field. <clears throat> his brothers get tired. They're gonna go kill him. And then they said, no, let's not kill him. Let's put him in slavery. Let's sell him off. He makes it, goes through prison, all this wonderful stuff. And he saves his people. God took that and he turned it for good. You go on in scripture and you come to this guy named Moses. He was saved as a kid who was supposed to die, supposed to be murdered, but he wasn't. Raised in Pharaoh's home, ends up killing a person, becomes a murderer, awesome. Flees and runs, so now he goes from a murderer to a scaredy cat, and he wanders the wilderness until he hears God's voice, and he took that, and God made it for good. He turned it for good. You go on in scripture, and you come to this lady came, uh, called Rahab, who was a prostitute. Awesome. Sleeping around. She's a prostitute, known prostitute. She hid some spies, though. The Israelites. And through faith, she hung some cloth outside her window and was saved. And God turned it for good. You go on in scripture and you come to this judge by the name of Samson who had a Nazarite vow. In other words, he's commended to God to follow God in all these ways, but he breaks them, breaks the vows. He has an anger issue, has a maybe, I feel like Samson a lot of times because I wanna do revenge. So he, he feels like he's made a fool and he ties um, 50 foxtails together. The fox is still attached to him, by the way, and alive. Lights him on fire. <laughs> and then says, run through the field. It's awesome. <laughs> Genius. Burns crops. Kills people. Grabs doc, uh, donkey jawbones and slays people. He's a lover of women. Lover of people who are not followers of Christ or of God. And at one last moment, God turns it for good as he pushes the pillars and kills thousands of Philistines. What about King David? Well, scripture does tell us he was a man after God's heart. He was a shepherd, killed lions and bears, awesome. He was a warrior, famous story of Goliath. Saul killed his thousands, well David kills killed his uh, ten thousands. He was a warrior. He was a musician. He was a king. He was an adulterer and he was a murderer. Wasn't happy, wasn't content, sitting at home, looks over a fence and goes, oh, I like her. I think I'll have her. Calls her in, sleeps with her. Gets, she gets pregnant. Her husband comes home. Hey, kill him. Put him to the front lines, kill him. but God turns it for good. What in your life does God want to turn for good? What in your life has God allowed to happen to you, whether it be abuse, whether it be an addiction, whether it be a co-addict, whatever it may be, what has happened in your life so God can make it for good, so God can do this, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. For me, it's my sex addiction. When we first started, we had two people. 
in my sex addiction class. And then it grew to four. And then now we have, it's probably one of our larger classes. To see how God can take these things and turn it for good. I'm gonna invite Joseph back up here. I'm gonna pray. And we're gonna sing another song. Because I want you guys to focus and I want you to think, what is God doing in your life? What victories do you need in your life that he can turn for good? You may not be able to see it right now because you're stuck right in the middle of it, but what does God want to turn for good? Let me pray. Lord, I just come to you. I thank you so much for who you are. I thank you for this story. I thank you for the fact that me, a wretched sinner, that you would not avoid me, you would not go a different direction, but that you would come and you would want to sit with me, as Revelation says, that you knock at the door. And Lord, help me in those moments that I don't want to open the door to actually go to that door and open it, to invite you in, to have you sit with me and to eat with me and to minister to me. And Lord, may these folks that are struggling with things in life these hurts, these pains. May they be able to see that you want to minister with them, that you want to turn it for good. And so you help them see that today. In Jesus' name, amen. Victory I'm gonna see the victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. Yes, I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. You take. Guys, hold on to that truth that God will take those things that the enemy meant for evil and he will turn it for good. He will turn it for good. Okay. Let's close our time with the serenity prayer and then we'll head out to group and after group we have uh, drumsticks. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time Enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did the sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. Amen.